And however, I was always somehow missing a link in between those two topics because I found on the one hand side that culture plays such a decisive role in OD and I'm speaking of culture not only in terms of uh, national cultures but culture in general and on the other hand the intercultural topic which is represented mostly in organizational terms by theater uh, for instance uh, but I still perceive this as being somehow two parallel worlds and that's why when I learned about the initiative of INOIC I thought okay that's now that's a great place, that's a place where international OD practitioners from companies but also who work as consultants are coming together and that's finally going to be a good platform where we can put more focus and more consciousness on building the bridge between interculture and OD. And that's also going to be the focus in our uh, first um, session now to which I very warmly welcome Elisa Alberto. Uh, whom I also uh, cooperate with very closely in everyday working life. And it was a true jewel when I found Elisa because she actually also has those two pillars in her heart of interculture and OD. And she will now tell us a little bit more about herself and her background. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you very much. <laughs> Having a hand mic is actually really bad for an Italian, so um, I use my hand, so it's already bad enough that I have that in my hand. So basically, I will keep doing that. I will try to speak loud enough, so maybe you, I don't even need a mic, but um, you will see why I usually do not use this kind of hand mics. So about, um, about myself, I had a, a short introduction. I, um, I love what you said, I, we start with why, because I also like to start with why. It's, um, it's my deeper motivation. Um, and my why is really like to support people to find and live their why, so people and organizations, and to keep developing. So I think this is actually the right place also for my why, so I feel really, really good here. Um, how I do is to challenge the status quo. So I'm, uh, I don't, when, when I hear this is how we do things here, this is where I start challenging and I start to challenge the way people think and how they do things. So this is um, an also personal motivation. And how I do is also by thinking creatively and together. So I, um, I'm really bad at sitting in front of a computer and trying to do a brainstorming session on my own that doesn't work. So Miriam knows it quite well. So I'm definitely um, a people person. And what I do is, um, of course, facilitation um, workshops. So I, I work mainly in change management and um, organizational change um, and do also some coaching and training that's also part of my work, but um, that's the change management is like my, my field. And then what the beach, where, where would I be if it would not be six degrees outside um, and I would not be here, I would be playing beach volleyball on the field. Um, that's like what I love to do, <laughs> sports also. And the shoes, like the Italian flag shoes, is because I, those are my roots, so I come from Torino. But I've been traveling a lot. I've been living in France, Holland, Denmark, Austria, US. So I've been traveling. And now I live here in Munich since six years. So it's become my base. But I, I still have my roots. And um, you, will, you can still see them, I guess, um, even though I've dis developed myself. So as you can see, I, I try to keep that hand still. But I use the other one. Otherwise, I'm, I'm dead. Like Italians without hands are dead. So just quickly about today. Um, this is what we, we plan, so we'll start right away with a warm-up, um, which is also warm-up for the whole two days. Um, then talking about culture, um, it's about sharing, so we will share a couple of models that we have, how we see cultures that maybe you can also use in your work. And then we'll uh, deep dive into a team development where culture was one of the main, main topics, so, um, um, and we will also show how we dealt with that. So and let you also get your, your own experiences because I'm, I know I have experienced people in front of me so I'm not having some managers but I, I have people who deal with that also in their work so I'm definitely interested to hear how you t do things, so this sharing. Right, so um, we'll start with, I think a good way to start a day is to greet each other and a good way to start a, greeting each other and getting into the topic of culture is to, uh, with what I call greetings of the world. So how it works is that you will get one greeting, so Mira is already um, distributing all around, so maybe you can pass it on. So each person will get one greeting, so you can have a look at it, 
And what we're going to do is that um, once you have memorized your greeting, then we all stand up and we start greeting each other according to that greeting. And how you do it is up to you. Like I've seen all the possible strategies, so um, people exchanging greetings. Um, so it's, uh, I put, there's no rubbing noses. So I took out that one, it was a bit too much. So once you've memorized your greetings, um, I will, I'm just looking at, does everybody have a greeting? Does it, is there anybody who says, I will try my fortune, I will try to pick another one, but we, you cannot choose. You can just say, I want to exchange it. So Mira just has some in their hands. So if you said, I want to try to see if I'm more lucky with a different one, you're welcome to do that. But I'm not saying that it's going to be better. So I said, rubbing noses is not going to happen. I took it out. Um, so I think the, the worst you get is three kisses or something. So. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I would say, like, let's just use the space that we have, uh, also a bit on the side, and we all stand up at the same time and just start greeting each other. It doesn't matter if you don't greet every single person, just go around and just start greeting each other. and ask not everybody, not about all the questions, but just get some, some highlights about the four questions. Maybe starting here about your expectations for the last, uh, for the next one and a half days. What, what did you discuss? What did you hear? Well, what I heard was that's an easier question, right? So it's a test if I was very attentive to what my, my co-pilot said. Um, his um, expectations were to deepen uh, relationships that he has created last year already and continuing the dialogue. Uh, with people that he met last time. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Maybe some more expectations. Um, John, what about you? What, what are you expecting for the next one and a half days? I'm in Eastern Europe and there are not too many people who even know what OD is, so this is exciting for me to be with people who, who know. So I'm here to actually learn and stretch. Very good, thank you. Going a bit more like not just to be only in the front and about like your international experience, how much international are you working? Maybe asking Bernd, what about you? Like um, how much in culture and how much international has an input in your work? I think every day you have different cultures. If you're going to enter a company, then you have different department cultures. Even, uh, you know, I'm living nearby Stuttgart, it's different to Munich, and um, <laughs> I have to travel 40, 40 kilometers, and then we have, let me say, you have the, the Stuttgart sweeping culture, and then you move to the Ostalp, the eastern part, and uh, it's completely different every day. Yeah. Yeah, these regional differences are definitely underestimated, I, I totally agree. In Italy, it's the same north and south of two worlds. And what about here, uh, Carl, like, what about your work? Like, does culture have an impact in what you do? And I left the, the word um, culture also open, so uh, exactly because we're not talking about only national culture, so um, which, can, which culture has an impact in your work? Moving on, on the side, maybe um, one or two more answers. Um, Sven, what about you? <laughs> Well, we started immediately to talk about culture and more in context of nationalities and then we slipped into corporate culture and how challenging it is, for example, if you have, uh, if you've grown up in a certain corporate culture, uh, corporate culture then to, you know, migrate into a new one and that there's a high risk of failure, for example. So that's something we exploited. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe you're um, Tim, <laughs> yes, you also have one, one culture influence in you, or different ones maybe. Which one does it have a b biggest impact on you? Um, absolutely Germany, because uh, I've, I'm American and I've lived here for a long time, and my wife is German, and I mostly work in Germany, so, yeah. So people laugh because they thought the US, but actually Germany, it's a good answer. All right, so thank you very much, so please have a seat again. So, um, I don't know if you heard about that proverb, it's a Chinese one, and it says, according to that, that only he who knows himself and his counterpart well can achieve 
a thousand successful encounters. So it's a very old Chinese proverb. And for me, translated to our business world would be a modern version. Only those who really understand their foreign colleagues and themselves can achieve success in international business. And I was doing um, a training, like a leadership training in, in China, I was talking about the cultural aspect with a group of Chinese and Japanese, and, and I was showing that slide, but on purpose. And what I did then, of course, is to check, is, is, you know, is it like a quote that I took out from Google, which doesn't really exist in China, or is it, is it, is it a real one? So I actually asked them um, to, and they said, yeah, yeah, we do have that, so it, it exists. And so he was actually, translating that for me in Chinese um, and saying that it's really about myself and understand counterpart, and you can win 100 battles, so you're not going to be defeated, so it's a success. So, that, that, so I'm, I don't know if he was trying to be polite, that I did not lose faith, and so he was trying to find a way to say, yes, it is true. So I would have to, I don't know, any people speaking Chinese here? Can you tell me if they were trying to make me not lose face, or if it's is a real translation of it? Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> or are you trying to be also polite? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I was trying to be also in the culture where doing that kind of training in China. <laughs> so, what is culture? Like we we heard already about different culture, the regional cultures, which culture is impacting you, the personal individual culture. For me, culture is a mix, and it's definitely complex. It's about our logic, like the way we, our values, our beliefs. So really, what's what's the, the, the deep inside way of thinking, and also the social practice. What it's what are rules uh, according to you? What what is right or wrong? But it's from your own perspective. It's a language. So you, as you can see, language in Italy, language is uh, also a lot of body language. It's the use of silence. The shared meanings, like if you live in a country, like for me, when I moved to a new country, um, it takes me always, let's say, a couple of years to learn the shared meanings, which you learn, like, you know, from even from television, from interactions, of the things that only people who live there know about. And that's also very regional. So and I live in Bayern, so that there are a lot of shared meanings in Bayern as well. And the lenses, it's the, the perception. So I always said, like, I always imagine myself wearing glasses. So I'm, I, I wear, put on my glasses, and the lenses are the way I see the world. So what I always said when I do a training about culture is about starting with your own perspective and thinking, how am I? And the way I see things from my perspective will be how I see the world. About cultural relativism, um, I, I found this is like a bit of a new term of, in, the, in the cultural field um, that culture always depends on where you're looking at. So if you think about intercultural trainings, about like how usually we're done, like working with Japanese do's and don'ts, why does that not work? Because if uh, an American would take on that training, it would be different than an Indian taking on that training because of their own perspective. So there was, I was once, um, heard about a team who were like made of um, UK, Fran French, and Indian. And, and it was about asking the Indian to describe the French. And they were saying, oh, the French, they're like so, so structural, so cold, they're, they're not so relationship-oriented, they're not so flexible. And then asking the British people to describe the French, the same people, the same six people, they were saying, Oh, those French, they're so chaotic, not structured, they're all flexible, they just do things, so there's, they talk so much. So it was amazing to see, this is for me cultural relativism, looking at one culture in the end from your own culture, so with your glasses. So this is what I guess quite some people here know about, the, the iceberg model, so, and which means culture is like made of things which are visible, with your senses, which is like art, language, is about behaviors, dresses. It, sorry, it's quite dark, and, and, uh, but it's really like on the top is things you see about culture. And on the bottom line, it's things you don't see, so the values, um, attitudes, beliefs. And so you have to dig, dig, um, dive really uh, deep to really find out 
what's that really about? So I like, uh, this is also what culture clash happens. So you're like, okay, uh, maybe you don't see it on the surface, but this is where, really what, where it's happening. And sometimes it's, it's a feeling like, I don't know, I don't know what it is about, about this person or that guy, but I don't know, we just don't get along so well together. Many times it's because of what's underneath, what you really believe. So I like, I like to think about culture as a tree, like it's a new way, I and mean, it's the same as the iceberg, it's just a different symbol. Um, but it's, it's again saying what you see on top, what's explicit, that you can observe, you can smell, you can taste, you can hear, um, that's, that's on the top. And it's the same concept of what, what's underneath, which is, with, which is implicit, which is customs, notion of time, beliefs, what is right, what is wrong. Um, religion has an impact on that as well, the history, opinion. So this is where we have to look at. And so when you meet somebody, it's where you have to try to understand what, what is there, what is, what is underneath. And of course you have, um, when talking about culture, you, you have stereotypes as well, um, which are like a natural human way of dealing with culture, I think. They've, they've been stereotypes, I think, since history of humankind. Just because you, we tend or try to put people in boxes, or things into boxes. It's just a way to simplify it. So um, I understand why there are stereotypes. Um, but be careful, because what happens is that stereotypes means saying um, all the Italians, all the Germans, it's always, so using those words, never, none, so they're really like fixed. It's, they become prejudice because you're talking, that you're not giving the freedom or space that something else could be. So what I'm saying is it's okay to, to have generalizations for you to have a guidance, to know, okay, which direction should I go? And so it's, it's okay to have that. But what happens with stereotypes is that when new information comes, it just doesn't c come through because it's so fixed. And with generalizations, with general statements, it means new information means maybe going to a new country or dealing with somebody from that country that you didn't know. So you learn something new about the culture and you can like, absorb it and really take on that. So that's what I'm like, um, that's for me a difference. So some people say, oh no, stereotypes, and stereotypes are dangerous, but um, that could be an alternative to think about culture to generalize. It's the same if you think about cultural dimensions, saying, okay, it's a direct communication style, indirect, and saying this is like for something for you to have a guidance, to try to position people, but it's still, you know, there's still a range. We're not putting people on the line, saying, okay, all the people act like that. And so I've been thinking a lot about culture and how to describe it. There are like thousands of models, and. And I tried for myself to, to make one model that helped me also in my work, something that, that it's not complex and easy to understand, because I think when easy, easy, things are easy to understand make, make more sense if you can really use it. Um, so I, uh, I sort of stru structure culture into four different cultures. So I put the pe person in the middle, so the person in, in the middle point, and then national culture, as I said, is one aspect. And by national culture means where were you born, where your parents were born. So I'm not talking just about you, also about your parents. And, and all the national cultures influencing the way you are. So if you, um, like, where's, um, uh, there you go, Tim, that you said about Germany. It's, um, it's also national culture. It's not where were you born, but it's still one influencing you. And then company's culture, so having worked for 20 years in a German or um, company from, from Bayern, like it definitely influenced you, but not only that one, maybe also other ones where you've lived, uh, worked before. Then I guess you would all agree that um, somebody who works in IT is, has some different traits compared to somebody working in marketing or in sales. So, I do see the professional culture also having an impact. And it, I'm always, I ask myself, is it because 
you study there and, and then is it because the way you are that you choose that field or is it the other way around that you become through that? So I, I think it's definitely that you choose also thing and to take on direction into something that suits you, where you feel, okay, it's, it's, it fits me as well. But professional culture, also what you study has an impact. And then personal culture and history. So somebody said that personal culture has the biggest impact. Um, it's, I've heard also statements saying it is only about individual culture and personal culture. Whether it's an individual, yes. Personal culture is just, uh, there is only the only one um, I would disagree. Yeah, I, since I've heard some managers saying, you know what, I travel the world, I get to so many cultures, you know, it's not about national culture. That's, that doesn't really matter. It's, it's just about people and the single people. So I know it's a, um, I, I said, it, it's a, I think it's important, but you cannot say there is no national culture because it, of the globalized world. I think the more I travel, the more I see that culture in different ways has an impact. So. So uh, I, I hope that this helps you, like, to for you to maybe to explain cultures also in your work in in a different ways and um, and use that model in creative ways as well. So we'll show you um, later on how I use that in in a team development, how I use the culture model, and um, but that was for me like an introduction to to give you a feeling of okay, what 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 we mean by culture and and to be like all on the same page, but. Uh, the next thing would be for me now to um, see this well as particular description on that um, on what I mean by those cultures would be to to have you discuss and exchange in, in, in pairs with your colleagues and think about um, yeah what are my thoughts about culture what have I heard and uh, also this morning about speed dating and and then now and and then yeah to share your thoughts your questions but maybe some comments so take some time to discuss in pairs. Um, we'll give you some um, facilitation cards but, uh, so to collect um, some concrete questions as well. Uh, but first start discussing, um, you have about 10 minutes time and then we'll collect some questions or some comments and we'll take it from there. So um, it, I said like in, uh, in pairs with your neighbors, um, so if you're not, if you're like sitting five people in a, in a row then you have to, to move <laughs> so you can find a pair and, and just 10 minutes discuss with your, with your partner. So one last minute and then I will collect some, some comments and questions. Okay, so we'll, um, you still have the chance to talk, but in a more focused way. I would like to, to hear, like, um, let's start with, with some, some questions. Of course, we're not going to go through all the questions, so that's why we also have some pinwalls there. Um, so we'll also collect them, uh, but I, I'd like to, to, to hear some questions because this is where I really have fun to get in interaction with you. So I, I, I like to present, but I like even more to interact. So who wants to share or ask a question or comments about culture? Don't be shy. Yeah, we have one here. <laughs> um, the first, is it on? All right. Um, the first point which we discussed was about the perception of HR in companies. And um, our question is, in what regard is the perception of HR in both business and organizational development a cultural issue? Meaning, um, perhaps could you elaborate Yeah, sure. So one of the generalizations, so it's not a stereotype, but certainly there's, there's evidence of a pattern, is that HR sometimes, or HR people, experience OD communities and OD practitioners as being superior in their behavior. Mm -hmm. So they, they regard HR people as somehow lower than, mm -hmm. and not as sophisticated, and not as possession of as much knowledge mm -hmm. as organizational development people. Mm -hmm. So it's in that context the question arose. Mm -hmm. And a concrete question would be, your, was it, uh, your concrete question that, that was... The, that's behind that question. Mm -hmm. And can you read the question one more time? It, in what regard is the perception of HR in both business and organizational development a cultural issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'll 
can comment on that. Um, it's it's a really good re good comments and question about HR. Um, it's I, I definitely see that um, the HR culture or how HR is perceived also within your organization um, is actually um, a weakness that organization, in the, I, I, what I observe that organizations are not using HR the way they could. Um, but I've also seen some organizations trying to develop that department in a different way, calling it people's department and, and the HR manages the people's VP, the people's or people and culture vice presidents. So um, I think for HR, like uh, in terms of the perception in both business OD, I think starting from OD, um, sometimes the perception that OD practitioners have on HR is that they're weak. And in terms of network and business development, we might think, well, is it the right person? Is it a decision maker? Should I go directly to the manager to, 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 get, a, to get a project, actually, to work with, with that company? Uh, on the other side, in terms of topic, what we work and what we do, they should be the right people to make also that decision because it's a culture topic, it's a team development topic. So I'm personally surprised why is not that happening. What I try to do, at least personally, is to strengthen them. So I've been having some change projects about uh, change managing the new ways of working. So a project where it's about changing the ways of working, uh, desk sharing, a flex office, this kind of work. And they were not involving each other. So in terms of perception and in terms of our role, it's, I think, maybe asking yourself the question, how can I strengthen that department like HR to develop it? So I, I think, but I see it as a bit my a little mission to support them to become a different kind of department and to, to strengthen themselves so that the perception within business will become, will be different. And then I think our perception of HR will also change. And so I think it's a bit of a, and I think more about what, what could be our role to support them um, to create a, a different kind of culture also and to attract the right people. Because of course, if the culture is not the right one, then you don't attract the right people to that position as well. So I don't know if, if it helps um, um, my thoughts about that, <laughs> that HR, but it's a really, really good topic that um, it also, it's also here for me, like I think it's an important one. Yeah? So, one, one part of the conversation that we had is around the relationship between culture and values. And we were very interested about your perspective. And then when I wrote down the question, my colleague told me, and she's German, you might be willing to make it more concrete. <laughs> I said, okay, nice, I'll give you a try. The fundamental idea behind it is that when I see some family who's coming from a different country, I might have the assumption that she has, she's all the different values. And, the, and, and or maybe she or he has the same values, but they express them in different ways. So my assumption might, might all wrong. And at the same time, maybe that the culture expressing value in a certain way might make me more sensitive to a certain value rather than another. And so I might be more attentive to myself, and you might be more attentive to other people. Yeah. And the, the last component is the connection between cultures, values, and identities. Because some people say value can change. But identity and your name, personal culture, and identity is something important yeah. for the whole, the whole of my life. Yeah. That's, that's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> It's what a, it was a high context way of asking a question, so you start with <laughs> But I think it was, I think the point, the point is the, the topic of values, and, and I think it's indeed one of the most complex aspects of culture. Talking about national cultures, but also talking about organizational cultures. If you want to, be, to change a culture, an organizational culture, the first thing we think about, okay, let's create new values. Let's implement the new values. And uh, oh, those five values sounds really good. We were working on a project on that, about changing culture, and, and it's hard. Because can you actually change cultures? Can you actually change values? Can you influence them? And I think you can do that only with behavior. So I think values influence behaviors. So the value is, 
um, a value gives you the answer, should I do that, that or that? So it's like for you, and if you want to change the other way around to change the values to influence behavior, you, you actually have to start with behavior. And, and it's hard, let's, uh, let's make it concrete. A value could be um, appreciation, for instance. Wertschätzung in German, appreciation. What does appreciation mean? So, uh, so what you do is like you translate that into behaviors and it could be appreciation, could be money. So I guess appreciation in the US could sometimes could be translated into money, not all the time, but it could, could have a value because um, it's, 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 a, it's showing appreciation. And other countries could be appreciation, sh putting that person in, in front and saying in front of others, well, you did a great, a great work. At the same time, that behavior would not be maybe the right one in a culture where putting people on, on the stage is not the best way to show appreciation. So that's why it's so complex and exactly what you said. If people are doing something, is it because of the value? Yes. How they interpret that value, it's again translating into the behavior. So I see a connection between values and behavior and they influence each other. And if you want to, you, you can't really change values 100%, you can influence it through behaviors again. Uh, national culture thing, it's, um, it's quite rooted. So uh, it's something you learn. So values is also something you learn from the beginning, from your parents, from school. Um, so there are certain values which are really deep inside in, in the way you, you're, you were born. And, and then you translate it, after. you don't think so much about it. It's just the way you act. When you think about this model, like value and behavior, I like very much the idea of Robert Dells, who has an intermediation like the skills and the capabilities that enable you to act in a certain way. Do you think that would be helpful to integrate this into a model you just uh, mentioned at the moment, or mm -hmm. would it be something different that does not match your idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's definitely, it's definitely making sense. Um, it, it, like the, you, you're talking also about the skills, right? Uh, the capabilities that enable you to behave in a certain way. Right. It's, it's actually a good point because the sometimes you, like, you don't do certain things because you're not able to do it. You just don't know how to do it. So it's definitely true. So I guess if you're talking about culture change or influencing a culture, trying to change a culture, you have to consider that. So I would say, there, like it's, it's, I would put it as a, a strong and very important point, especially for uh, organizational culture. Uh, talking about national culture thing, it's, it's more something you, you learn from, it's something more like you've learned from yourself. So it's just something you, not you were born with, but you, you learn through your first years and through your life. So you, um, some people, I had a um, training yesterday, they asked me, can you actually change your personal values over life? Like, are you born with values or, and then it's all you have all your life? And, and my answer said, no, you, you learn on the way. So uh, I think there are some who stays and it should also be, otherwise you just sh change with the wind, but there could be some new one that influences you um, and then becomes important values for the way, again, the way you are. I can talk, we could, I think we could talk like for 10 minutes about it. Um, maybe let's, um, I hope that that helped you to, spero che ti abbia un pochettino, but we can talk more about the topic of values also. Per ore. You also had one? Come on. Yeah, we were talking about is there a kind of meta culture, so something which is really connecting different things. I was talking about love. I said, well, love is perhaps a, a kind of, uh, uh, cultural constant, and Marcus was talking about conflict. So, so um, um, this was just the idea to say, well, we can look to the differences, but what is about the connecting dots where you really can can uh, bring things in? And now, so I think appreciation is for me a bit. Uh, I don't know whether it's a value. It's also a need, and it's also really a, 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 it's very, very much connected to love. So, so I think this could also be an interesting aspect. And, and this is a question. Um, is this an approach or, or mm -hmm. could this be helpful to look also for the connecting things, not only for the things where, where, mm -hmm. where the differences are? Yeah, very good question. Um, I, I agree. Um, I've heard also people saying, oh, we, I don't talk about differences anymore, I just use commonalities and common values. Um, 
it's, it's a good approach, indeed. Um, and also what I do is try not to strengthen intercultural differences, um, but, but to say, because I totally agree, the more you strengthen it and put focus on that, the more actually you uh, inducing it in a way. So I agree. At the same time, my experience, especially working with, with, with managers, is that um, they tend to, well, they see differences, and, and it's, it, the, the way they think is like to say, well, it's a difference, and, and they need structure. So even though I'm not the biggest fan of cultural dimensions, because it's again, you know, p positioning, at the same time, I've seen that it helps to give guidance in, in a way or the other. So um, I, I tend to see, also when I do intercultural training or intercultural team development, we look at similarities as well. So I, I, I keep that in focus. So it's, it's a thing, it's a good comment to say, okay, if I work with people, let's not just talk about the difference, but try, try to find commonalities. And, and, and it's surprising for some, for that sometimes for people to see that they have so many of them. But good comment, yeah. Yeah, we discussed a topic which is maybe connecting to that uh, because you can read sometimes about a global business culture and uh, is there something like a global business culture or is it just an etiquette or something? How would you judge that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that goes a bit to, um, to that comment saying uh, with a globalized world are, are like in 50 years still, are we still going to have cultural differences and um, I think it's evolving. Um, and, and I think there is a ten if you, you know, if you're a Japanese, a Japanese who have studied in, in Europe and work in the US, um, it will be definitely different than a Japanese who hasn't had that experience, this international experience. So indeed there is uh, some common, but I, I don't think it's, you can actually put it in, in one part or in an umbrella saying this is an international business culture because of what I keep on seeing, and uh, as I said, I, <laughs> I, I had a, a, a training in, with, in China like three weeks ago, and I had Chinese and Japanese, which is not the best mix of cultures, if you know a little bit about um, cultural uh, conflicts. Um, and, and I was asking the Japanese, exactly because, you know, the greetings, this greeting, if it, uh, my thinking was, like, you know, international business, people don't do that anymore, maybe. I just wanted, and I checked with him, and I said, of course we do it, and of course this is we doing hand, shaking hands is more about making an agreement. So like what the, he was really greeting me like like that, and so not and, and of course the, another Japanese was there who lived in Germany. Um, she was greeting me with a handshake. So of course there is that, but the question that are all people impacted by this more international and and, and I think. It has an impact, but it, um, I, my belief is that it's not going to become one global business. But it's, this is the, the way I, I've seen it, that it's, they're still developing, evolving. Um, yes, to me this uh, raises the question of global leadership and how do they incorporate intercultural competence in their roles. Um, on the one hand, they have a set of skills that you talked about. They have a skill set that they have to have in the background knowledge. And uh, on the other hand, they have to have uh, a being. I mean, a being. How do they appear in the world? Mm -hmm. um, now, that's a tall order to bring those together. Um, uh, and that's, I think, at least I am dealing with that uh, very much. Mm -hmm. How do we get that on the same page? to have something like uh, global leadership competence, mm -hmm. uh, to, to bring all these to coordinate and harmonize these um, aspects. I won't say two aspects, because there are a lot of aspects that feed into that. Yeah. Um, so taking this step further, global leadership, um, intercultural competence in global leadership would, would be a big question I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah also a good question. Um, Exactly. It's a, are the skills different? Uh, to be a global, a good global leader, are there like additional skills you need? Uh, definitely yes. And, and and then there is another complexity aspect. I think when you're a global leader, is the virtual aspect because most and most um, global managers have an international team which is spread in different regions. Um, so I think you have that complex in terms of um, how to deal with different cultures and to lead different cultures and how much do you adapt yourself like are you if you're 
managing Chinese people, for instance, are you becoming a Chinese leader? And I was, uh, when I was in China, for instance, I was asking them because they, uh, that group of people work for a German company. And I said, um, about leadership style, how do you feel about the leadership style from maybe from your German colleagues? And they actually they said, well, we chose to work for this German company because we appreciate that kind of leadership style and we never ever want to go back in a Chinese company because that's not the style we prefer. So what I'm saying to global leaders is that uh, you have to be aware of maybe differences, maybe ask for what's the preference in giving feedback, for instance. So I think a skill, it's about um, being respectful and, and being a good listener and asking, what, asking what's your preference and getting into dialogue to also explain what you are. So I think it's about being really good self-aware how am I, what is my preference, and to share that with that person, so really to get in, in connection and, and trying to learn. Uh, what you, before, like uh, 20 years ago, like, 20, 30 years ago, it was about trying to learn about every single culture in the world to become a good global leader, and I think this is not about it anymore. It's about being able to slightly adapt without losing yourself, so not just going local, but being yourself, adapt in certain ways, but finding ways together, and it goes back to the personal culture, what's the personal preference. And then um, on the virtual aspect, which is for me connecting and being a global leader, um, it's really about um, also like, what's the role? You become more, more of a coach, I think, because you have to facilitate that also that virtual interaction, um, so you, you have to let go which is very hard for some managers, like because you cannot control things anymore. Um, so it definitely goes against the autocrats <laughs> so if you want to be a good global leader and a good virtual, virtual leader. So, um, so it's, it, it's, like, it, it's, a, it's a complex one, and I think it's also developing the more complex um, the global business is also becoming. But um, we can definitely talk more about it. At, <laughs> I even wrote a book on the topic of global lead of virtual leadership because also this virtual topic interests me particularly. So thank you for your comments. I saw a timeout, unfortunately, even though um, what, um, what we're going to do, we're going to collect still your questions and comments. So we, we have here a pin wall, so I'm going to read that also through during the break, or you can come here. So after the break, we might have time for at least maybe one or two questions. And, um, and then if you have some maybe comments, so that it's not a question, it's more of a comment, we can still collect them on the other flip chart, uh, the other pin wall. And otherwise we have um, a 15 minutes break. So we, we continue at 20, 20 to 12. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. I, it's good that Miriam was stopping me so time is over. Otherwise, I think I could have continued like for, for hours because this is where I really enjoy like hearing your point of view. Um, I was reading what you wrote, so we can definitely talk more also over lunch break. And one thing, one, uh, there were two questions or comments. One is, um, how do I use consider the model when working abroad? And the other, what did the French say about the French? <laughs> And, and, and I thought these two questions um, fits quite well the, the next part, which is a concrete case um, about an intercultural team uh, working together on a project. So this is a, a case where I put in practice the model and about the French, think about the French, it's always more like, what do the Italians think about the Italians? So it was not the French, but um, there was that, 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 that perception. So I really like that quote. Um, from Eric Butterworth saying, seeing is not believing, believing is seeing. You see things not as they are, but as you are. So it goes back to um, your perception and your glasses. So you'll hear my glasses many times. I can see, <laughs> and I'm not, it's not a perception, that the beam will move on in the, in the front a little bit, so I'm sorry about that. 
All right, so we, we're going to look at this case study and how those countries or cultures look at the other, the other countries and cultures. So the case is about an international project team. It was for a rollout um, of a project that was uh, supporting them doing change management for them, and it was a, let's say, a typical headquarter rollout in the market. And the team involved was, um, so it was a headquarter team, which was Germany, nationality of Germans and Italians, there were about 15 peoples, people. And um, what happened is that, um, so we had a kickoff, we launched the project, and after some months, um, there, we realized, or they realized themselves, we have some issues or some problems, it's not working smoothly. And they told me, well, I think we need two things. We need an intercultural training for the Italians so they could understand the Germans. And, and then we need a team development for the project team. So let's spend the money and, and do that. And I said, well, why don't we have just one thing together and we have a team development that includes culture. So we, we don't do like, intercultural trainings, but we just do it in the team development. And so um, what I'm sharing with you is like um, the, the design and, and, and the goals of that workshop and, and reflect with you what I've done there and maybe you can take something with you in that similar situation. So um, a lot of text, but the goals were like three main things. One is this mutual, mutual understanding, which was the, the, the biggest issues, I think, at that point of time. And then it was about talking about collaboration between functional line and employees and really trying to find a, a doing modus that works. So, so roles and responsibilities was definitely also a topic or an issue. So it was not just about culture. Uh, and then defining clear next steps. So that was like what I defined with them. And this is the part where they would have done an intercultural training. And so I said, let's just include it over there. Yes, we... And there was the agenda, so I pushed them to have a, uh, they wanted to have um, one day, and, and I said, let's have a one and a half day, and starting on, on, on day one around lunchtime, and, and having an evening together, and then having the next day together. Um, so the Italians could travel in the morning, so it was, you have to be effective, also cost aware. So, and, and it's a good way, because you, you, you need that as well, like to, you need to build up relationship as well, especially for Italians, it's definitely an important point. So what I've done is the following, before the workshop, I conducted interviews with each participant. So I, and in my interviews, it was not, um, maybe I'm quite sure you do the same when you prepare a team development, but the questions I was asking were not just about roles and about the project, the first question I was asking were about cultures. So I was asking them, how do you, perceive your German colleagues. And then I was asking also things like, how do you think they perceive you, Italian, the Italian team? And then I was also asking them, and how would you describe yourself? How would you describe your culture? So I was challenging them to start thinking also about this other perspective, how do you think the others see you? And I collected those. Um, so what I've done then, um, over here, like, I, I started the day with um, that topic. The theory was, and it was the wish from the client to have this intercultural training part. I said, okay, I can do that. I can give you some theory, but I will call it the theory. So I will share something about also differences if you want to get have that. So I did that. Um, but then we'll go into the practice about your situation, your team, collect the interview, what, show you what you mentioned, and work on that, so on, on your situation. So again, going away from just general differences, but go concrete. So I started with the theory. So we're going to look now more only on that part, which is the part about culture. Otherwise, it would be a full day. <laughs> and, and this is what I was doing with them, like showing what they interculturally said about difference. This is just an example about uh, communication style. And, and of course, this is quite, Theoretical, so it's there is a true behind, and um, and my point was to tell them um, we're not doing an, just an intercultural training, not not because they're bad, but because we want to work on a team. We're working together on a project. So I'm um, I'm going to talk more about which differences I thought more important, just to show you which slide I was using. The practice was the outcome of the interviews. 
So what I've done was to say, okay, now I show you very transparently what you have said, a summary of the interviews, and I was showing first about what the Italian, the, the Italian point of view, and sort of like, uh, what, how do they describe the German culture from their point of view? And so like less flexible, more focused on details, precise, more organized, punctual to the second, deadlines are very important, more rigid. It was actually, they were, just to make sure, it's, it sounds quite negative, but it's because there was, there was some frustration there. So it was actually, um, uh, you could get some, some of that because of, of also the frustration the team were having. And, and then how they see themselves was dynamic and creative, but also more unstructured, more last minute working. So they, they were aware of that as well. And then when I asked the Germans how they see the Italian, easygoing, cooperative, respect for Yerke is more chaotic as well expert in making a storm out of a glass of water. <laughs> so I think they were talking about concrete examples. Get quickly dramatic, so more emotional, do not avoid conflict, and, but all very professional. And then how they see themselves, correct, engaged, bureaucratic, task list, focused, and highly structured. And I can tell you that, that was, and then I let them discuss in, in, in mixed groups about, about those and what does that mean. And, and the, the, the quality of the discussion they had, and the, the, it, was, it was amazing. I could really see like some aha moments, like trying to, say, oh, and then to, trying to explain themselves why is that. So I will, I will really I push them in this discussion to explain the reason behind that. Why is that in Italy, for instance, like this um, the dynamic and flexible and creative, and so why is that an important part of working, for instance? So what happened is that what they realized, and, and then I supported them to understand that, is how they work. So let's see if I can manage that, if you can see it. So I, I explained them, like, if it's a project work, it's about time also. It's about working on a project. So there's two ways of seeing time. One is more like linear, of course. So you just go from A to D. And there are like some clear steps. And if it's a project, especially from a German perspective, you would just plan it. So there was a planning phase, and then you, you define a plan. And then there's also a way of doing it, which is, of course, like oh, let the question, like, what do you do if something Unplanned comes in in the plan. <laughs> so um, this is like, what do you do if like there's something happening that stops your plan? So your linear time is there. So what ten, the tendency in Germany would be to go back and make a new plan because that's there was an obstacle. So it's about plan, or, or at least maybe you don't go the back all the way, but you go back a little bit and then. Again, structurally, you, it's about the process, and you plan the new process just to know what to do. What Italians would do, they have the, because they also have the plan, um, and if there is something happening, what it said is like, well, we get here, and what we do is like try to find ways around. Okay, it doesn't work. Go like this, or maybe like this, and and they find like a new way, and then they also get there but with a different way. So they find creative ways to go around the obstacles. So what happened over the, in, in that project completely was when obstacles were coming that comes all the time, um, the Italians were frustrated because the Germans were going back, were stopping everything and planning it again, so really making sure that they had a clear plan to avoid risk. So the focus of the value there is like avoiding risk. So the better you plan, the less risk you can avoid. And, and Italian was getting frustrated because like, well, we, we have an alternative solution, which is we didn't plan that one. It's a, a new one that we thought about. Uh, but we, we have to go into the unknown because we don't know if it's going to work, but we try it and then we go there and then we'll find a way and then we get there. And so the, the Germans are completely frustrated because they have no idea what they're doing. They're like, is it going to get a good outcome out of it? 
And, and Italian feels like, don't you trust us? We know what you're doing. And we, we are focusing here. Are we, are we talking about the goal? Or are we talking, and, and the Germans like, yeah, but we need a process to get to the goal. So uh, this is to show you, like, a, it, we're not even talking about, you know, direct and indirect communication. It's also an important va uh, value, but we're talking about how you work together on the project and how the ways of working can differ from one culture to the other. So this is an example that I've seen like, helping also some other people when I was doing trainings, like to see how people work, work together and, and, and do things. So this is, for instance, was one thing that out of the discuss together, and then I was trying to support them to understand and also asking them, I don't know, we have one other Italian in, <laughs> in the audience. I don't know if you agree with that, being more of a linear, um, ways of thinking and then finding more creative and flexible ways of reacting. We did a speed dating this morning and what I've done, that's how to use the model. I used the model to do a speed dating with them. So I, what I've done um, is actually to, to create some little interview cards, one per each cultural circle. So the first one, the first one was interviewing each other, asking questions about the national culture. And then we, they were switching to the next person, as we did this morning, and they were talking about corporate culture. Well, same company, still different offices and different maybe departments, so they were talking about that and then moved into the professional culture, they had different functions. So they were purely interviewing on, on their professional cultures and then the last round was about personal culture. So it was really like talking, well, it was more than two minutes as you had in the morning, so they were thinking about five minutes time to interview each other, it was still speed. Um, and they had some more than just one question, so on each card, were like, where are you from, where your parents are from, where did you grow up, where did you go to school, uh, which culture have an impact on you. So there was about culture, they were taking notes. And then, it's hard to see, but um, we draw like something on the walls. And after each interview, I would go to the wall to your shape and write down some notes in red if it's about national culture. And then after the second interview, I would go back to, your, to, that, to, that, to that one shape and write that comment. So basically, you are getting to know four people from different perspectives. So you would not get to know one person on all four cultures. You were getting some bits. And then, in the end, you, you had that big picture. So you could go there and then see that person as complete. So for me, it was also the message that I was telling them is also, be careful, because when you get to know somebody, you get to know one little piece of that person, which is maybe now more the national one, more the personal culture. Uh, so the exercise, the idea behind was also that, to, to understand that. And what we, did the, what we did in the end was also to create a little passport <laughs> based on the results. So to have a, like a team, um, team overview on, on all the participants and having a summer about the national culture, corporate culture, professional culture, and personal, and, and personal culture. So it was, that was like the, the documentation out of the speed dating. Just checking the time, I'm still good. Um, so which cultures have, uh, or aspects or dimension have uh, come into play? Um, the last thing I wanted to give you as an input was, um, uh, how I try to observe things and what helps me. So I said cultural dimensions have, for me, not the main rule, but um, you, some, some of you might know of stated, as then I mentioned, are not my favorite ones. <laughs> um, I try to take other dimensions, I try to create my own way of interpreting things, but there's one book from Erin Meyer called The Culture Map. Um, it's a book I really recommend on, on culture. It's, I think, two or three years old, but it's an excellent book, and she created really good dimensions, which are very business-based. Uh, so when I use those with clients, they usually say, oh, okay, I understand what you're talking about. And this is was to show you like what German and Italy are on the trusting dimension. And, and the question that I was asking them was like, how do you trust and why do you trust? And you basically have two kinds of trust. I, I usually draw it in a, 
very simple kindergarten way, which is saying there are actually two ways. One is cognitive, so it comes from the head. So I trust you because I know that you're a good business partner. I trust you because you meet your deadlines. I trust you because I have good experience working with you. And the other one is more, let's say, effective trust. So I trust you because we have a relationship. I trust you because I know you without a mask. I know all, I really know you. We got to know each other, so we have a story together. And of course, how it's translated on a scale would be more like task-based, so more like task-oriented, how we call it, or relationship-oriented, or relationship-based, which is because how you build trust. So I, I like her interpretation of a scale of task and relationship because it's very focused on, um, on trust. And see, here you can see that there is a, a gap. So the German is definitely more task but we, as you can, some people ask you, what about the US? They, they're, it's not that the relationship is not important, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that um, people can trust only working together without knowing too much about each other. I can hardly work. I, it's, I have a hard time working with somebody if I don't feel I have a relationship. So I, I, sometimes um, I had some difficult situation in Germany because I was trying to build up their relationship in that depth. And in Germany, some, some people prefer to separate private from work. So it's like one is work and one is private. We don't have to become best friends. And, and I was not trying to become best friend. I was just trying to build up that relationship I needed. So, um, this is where misunderstandings happen because the Italians think the Germans are not interested or they don't care about the relationship, which is not true. They do, but they don't need that level of relationship to work effectively together. That's the same. He was like, if it's climate or sun related, um, every time I go to, I, I was, last week I was in Mallorca and I thought, I think it's sun related because of course with the nice weather what why you're sitting in office so um it, i think it's a long discussion um i know that how she came up with those it was a, a big a long study that she's done with interviews and and then positioning according to the preference and what people have a, as a main focus yeah um in her book like she's not um She's not saying that the, the, the dimensions from offset are bad, uh, and she's, she's basing, uh, she's building up on those. Uh, what she tried is uh, like to translate them in a way that for managers are um, more easy, easier to grasp. So using, uh, this is just one, I can show you some others, but she's, she has one about like making decisions, for instance, which is something you ha it happens to you all the time. How do you make decisions? Um, so that, that was her interpretation, trying to have it more, um, understood or understandable for, for managers. There was another one about scheduling, so linear time and flexible time. So, and this is what I was explaining you before about what's, what's linear, what's flexible. And this is again where you could see Germany having a very linear time, like, which is, it's, 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 it's a value as well, like this being the structure, um, it's an important value. And and it, it is definitely more on that side. So linear time project steps are approached in a sequential way. And in a flexible time, it's, um, there's a more fluid matter. And, and what does fluid mean? Like, what does fluid mean? I had that exactly yesterday. I had a, a group of Germans and Italians working for the same company. And the Germans said, what I don't understand, no, the Italians said, the Italian said, what I don't understand, if I, if I call a German colleague, I said, Jürgen, um, I need your help. I need you to do that by Friday. What Jürgen does is sending me his capacity plan, his Excel list, showing me all the tasks he's working on, and explaining me why he's not able to do that, because he's completely booked for the week, so there's no chance he can do that for fri on Friday for me. And he said, he doesn't understand that. I'm not asking you to explain you why you cannot do that. I'm asking you for a favor. And, and he's really, f and, 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 and German said, well, and we are frustrated because we agree on a deadline on Friday. And then you call me on Friday morning saying, I'm sorry, but I had this and this and this coming in between. And you're postponing it to Monday. And, and so, and, and what happened is that 
expectations, of course. Like the Italian is more expecting uh, if there's something more important, so priority, jumping in, I will, I'm flexible, I will add time and I will put you on top of the list. Um, while the Germans said, okay, we have an agreement and we agree that that's that. And, and, and if I want to meet all my agreements, it's until Friday, so task. Um, so I'm not going to jump, even though I like you and we're good colleagues, um, I, I don't want, I want to keep my commitment. So, but this goes back to this one. He's focusing on, on, on getting the task done and he's focused on what well, I need, I need help. And I would help you if, you if you asked me to do the same, I would work later or I would postpone something else. So there is more flexible. That's why fluid, <laughs> fluid matter, changing tasks and opportunity, as opportunities arise, opportunities or problems. Um, so if you're working with Italians or even more as in India, for instance, if you want to, um, to get things done, what do you do? you make sure that you keep on being on the top priority list. So that's why you have to call them all the time, because otherwise the other people are calling more than you, and you will be, so you're, you were here with your deadline on Friday, and it comes this, and this, and this, and this on top, and then your priority is not there anymore, so it doesn't matter if it was Friday, uh, the other was, became more, more, more important because they follow up. So it's, it's, um, I was trying to explain, I know it's complex, but I was trying to give an explanation why working together on a project from different cultures could be a challenge. So those dimensions, those are um, from appearing global, they're more like based on, on off-status dimension. You have direct and indirect, it's also one where you can have, this is the most common one, knowing okay, it's, that Germans are more direct in the way they communicate while um, uh, Italians are more indirect. But I put China also to show, okay, it's again relative how direct and indirect you are. So one last thing I'm going to give you, and then I'll let you um, some time to discuss again, because I'm interested about what you're saying, is the virtual aspect of that. Um, we mentioned it before with the topic of global leader, leader and um, we looked at this distance, and um, this is something um, I mentioned. I wrote a book on uh, called "Making Virtual Real," so the importance of trying to make virtual interaction real as well. And those are the distances I identified. This is just one, and then you have the physical distance, of course, the most well known. You have the technological, how to use those, that technology to interact and work together. And this is the, for me like the most critical one talking about virtual, um, it's about the social distance. So how do you, um, how do you actually build that relationship and, and look at the social aspect when you work virtually? So that was the last thing I, as a thought that I wanted to give you um, about this little case, which I know was a very s speed or quick thing, and I think I'm already over time looking at Miriam. <laughs> So, um, so, of course, if you're interested in more about it, it's, um, it, we can talk about it later. But, um, and also about the models, the cultural models. Um, I have a copy here to have a look at it, so you can, <laughs> if you want to make pictures of, of the models, for instance, um, it's also here what I was explaining to you. It's, um, I took some of this information also here from, um, from the book. So now it's up to you, but it's now back to you. Um, so I want to describe in bigger groups. And it's about what surprised you, what's in, what was interesting, any similarities, what your experience, again, your, bring your own experience, and what are some best practices from, from your side. And we'll do it, um, we'll do, um, I said six, seven people, I do like groups of seven, no, seven groups of, uh, and um, how many people do we have? So I would, I would say uh, we'll just count, I want to mix, I don't want to have this, uh, so we'll, we'll just start, we'll count to seven, and, and, and let's see, so one, Feel free to sit wherever you want. There are tables available. You can stand if you're tired. You can uh, get around the table or sit down. 